This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. Uncharted territory. The stock market is having its best win streak in a quarter century. But it has some investors scratching their heads. Around the table, retail CEOs sit with President Trump with one very big concern on their minds. Distracted driving. Can a startup keep drivers from picking up their phones? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Wednesday, February 15th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. The stock market did something it has not done in 25 years. All three major indexes closed at records now for five consecutive days. According to Dow Jones, that's the longest streak since 1992. Investors today encouraged by new reports that show the economy has picked up a little momentum. They also continue to be optimistic about the prospect for tax cuts, which the president reiterated today, and about regulatory rollbacks. That helped lift financial stocks, which in turn pushed the broader market higher. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 107 points to 20,611. The Nasdaq gained 36, and the S&P 500 advanced 11. As we've been reporting, those tax cuts hinge on a key proposal, a border tax that would generate a lot of revenue. But large retail CEOs are worried. The industry has warned that form of ta a border tax could hurt their business and raise prices for consumers. Well, this morning, a group of retail executives went to the White House, where they met with President Trump, who said only that tax rates would be lowered and simplified in a plan that will be outlined soon. When the retail CEOs left the White House, they made their way to Capitol Hill, where negotiations on the border adjustment tax are taking place. Elon Mui picks up the story. Retailers spent a long day here in Washington meeting with lawmakers to fight against the border adjustment tax. This tax would raise the cost of imports and retailers say it could force them to raise their prices as well. They've met with many lawmakers here in Capitol Hill, including Representative Kevin Brady, who is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee and one of the biggest supporters of the border adjustment tax. They also met Just with today, Senator yeah. Warren Hatch of the Senate chair. Finance Committee. We caught up with some of the CEOs as they were leaving that meeting. Here is AutoZone CEO Bill Rhodes speaking to reporters. Our key message today is we really appreciate the openness of everyone from the White House to the House to the Senate. Uh, we represent over 42 million American jobs and we're here to make sure that we're all looking for a pro-growth agenda to move this economy forward. Now, this issue is something that has divided the business community. The American Made Coalition, which is made up of manufacturers like GE and Boeing, are actually in support of the border adjustment tax. Here is a statement that they put out today. They said that opponents of tax reform are defending an outdated and broken system that subsidizes cheap foreign imports at the expense of American manufacturers and workers. There's still much debate on this issue here on Capitol Hill as well. Representative Mark Meadows, who is head of the conservative House Freedom Caucus, is very skeptical of the border adjustment tax. Meanwhile, Senator Hatch has said he still has questions about how this tax would work in reality, how it would impact consumers, and how it would impact businesses. So the Republican Party is still not sure how it will move this issue forward, both in the House and on the Senate, and retailers are hoping to take advantage of that indecision to shift the ball in their favor. For the Nightly Business Report, I'm Elon Moy here in Washington. On the eve of his confirmation hearing, the president's pick to head the Labor Department is withdrawing his name from consideration. Andrew Puzder, the CEO of CKE Restaurants, which owns Hardee's and Carl's Jr., has faced criticism from senators about his business record and his failure to pay taxes for an undocumented housekeeper. The president now has to look for a new labor secretary as well as a new national security advisor who resigned over his communications with Russia. With so many questions, including some about the president's tax agenda, why doesn't the market appear concerned? 
Mark Zinder is a principal of Mark Zinder and Associates and former Franklin Templeton spokesperson. He's here to tell us why the market does not seem all that concerned. Good to see you, Mark. Good Welcome. to see you all as well. Thank you very much. You know, we just mentioned that the market has done something that it hasn't done in a quarter century, this winning streak. Yet, when you look at the aggressive agenda in Washington and some of the, the difficulties that have come up in the last couple of days, one would think that the market might have... Uh, a less positive reaction to that. What's going on? Yeah, you would think, but history has shown us that economics you know, matters more than politics. And so what you see going on in Washington, it matters in the short term, but in the long term, the economics trump all. You work with and for Sir John Templeton, one of the most uh, sort of storied investors of all time. What would he say about two things? One is the level of stock prices today, and two, in a broad sense, how an investor can assess the political risks and opportunities that are out there. Well, with regards to the stock market, he used to follow something called price to book. And let me explain. Um, he was a value investor, Benjamin Graham, a value investor. Benjamin Graham wanted to know what is the value of the company? What's its breakup value? And historically, stocks have sold about twice their breakup value. And right now, they're not that high. Um, they're about three times book value, and historically, 2.5 is, is the norm. So I don't think we're overvalued. What about the economics of, of the country right now? Um, we have the Fed probably on the, on the verge of raising interest rates at least one more time this year. Uh, we have a little bit of inflation coming in, which is good. Sure. Does that continue to underpin this market? I mean, do you longer term see this market continuing to move higher? Oh, absolutely. These are all good things. Um, you know, the one thing we have to look at as far as the stock market is people say, well, it's running long in the tooth, or the economy, the, the, right. this economy is long in the tooth. And what you have to look at is not how many years, but your average GDP growth expansion is about 23%. We're only up 10.6% trough to peak right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think we still have a lot of room to go. And as far as the bear market, they say it's a 20% correction. Well, well we had a 19.9% correction in August of 2011. Why didn't that count, right? That should count. So I think we have a lot more room to go. You know, a lot of people inside the Beltway, in the media, in New York and Washington, are wringing their hands over what's been going on in the administration. Already this week, he's lost uh, his national security advisor to a resignation. Now the labor secretary. Sure. There are uh, ongoing investigations into contacts between campaign workers and potentially Russian intelligence. But the market is playing past it, and I sense right. most of the rest of the country is focused on something that they see as far more important, and that is a better business climate. Absolutely. If, if you look at what is potentially coming down the pipe, right, what, stocks go up because earnings improve. Well, you start cutting taxes, tax reform, maybe you reform Dodd-Frank, that will improve corporate balance sheets, and of course, that makes things just look so much better going forward. All right, we'll leave it there, Mark. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you all. Mark I greatly Zinder appreciate it. You're very welcome. All right, now to those encouraging economic reports we just referenced. Americans went shopping in January. Retail sales picked up sharply last month, despite a decline in car sales. A steady combination of hiring and uh, uh, modest wage growth, discounting, those are keeping consumers spending. Also helping increase confidence in the U.S. growth scenario was the latest read on inflation, which showed the strongest monthly gain in almost four years. The Labor Department's consumer price index rose 0.6 percent last month, and that was more than expected. In the 12 months, though, through January, that index is up 2.5 percent, the biggest year-over-year -year gain since March of 2012. Fed Chair Janet Yellen returned to Capitol Hill today and reiterated her upbeat assessment of the economy. She also talked about the prospect for fiscal stimulus. I think market participants uh, likely are on anticipating uh, shifts in fiscal policy that will um, stimulate growth and um, raise, raise pro perhaps raise earnings, maybe tax cuts that will boost earnings. We've seen longer-term interest rates go up and the dollar strengthen, and that's consistent with expectations of an expansionary fiscal policy. Well, her testimony, along with strong economic data, nudged higher the odds of an interest rate hike in March. President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a joint news conference at the White House today. The two heads of state sought to bolster their country's ties, both diplomatic and business relations. Sima Modi tells us why investors were paying close attention.
The partnership between our two countries, built on our shared values, has advanced the cause of human freedom, dignity, and peace. These are the building blocks of democracy. Since the signing of the U.S.-Israel Free Trade Agreement over 30 years ago, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, trade between the two nations has grown tenfold. And with both leaders showcasing a strong desire to work even closer together, there could be more opportunity ahead for business. Netanyahu joined Trump in emphasizing the important relationship between the two countries in not only combating terrorism, but in business as well. I look forward to uh, working with you to dramatically upgrade our alliance in every field, in security, in technology, in cyber and trade, and so many others. The rekindled relationship between the two nations could unearth opportunity, with some asset managers saying now is the time to invest in Israeli stocks. Northern Trust, which oversees more than $300 billion, says cybersecurity and defense companies are poised to benefit from Trump's vote of confidence. Israel has already made the U.S. a key market for its businesses, with 94 companies currently trading on the Nasdaq, more than any other foreign listing. Some of the standouts, companies like Wix.com and SodaStream, each soaring well over 200 percent in the past year. And it's a two-way street. Silicon Valley also dependent on Israel. Amazon and Microsoft have been busy acquiring Israeli startups in recent years. And this could just be the beginning as Tel Aviv continues to emerge as a tech hub of the East. I'm Seema Modi for Nightly Business Report. Still ahead, fixing America's crumbling infrastructure. I'm Aditi Roy in Oroville, California, where the choppers are buzzing in the air, carrying bags of rocks ashore up that emergency spillway. I'll have that story coming up on Nightly Business Report. The Trump administration started making changes to the Affordable Care Act. The proposed rule would tighten the provisions to apply for coverage outside of open enrollment. It would also require consumers to pay back premiums due before signing up again. And it also cuts the open enrollment period for 2018 in half. Those changes would give insurers more time to have their 2018 plan reviewed and finalized by state and federal regulators. Now, separately, a government report said the pace of growth of health care spending is expected to increase nearly 5.5% in 2017 from a year ago. Well, health care and infrastructure are both top priorities for the White House and investors. Today, a new report showed that almost 56,000 U.S. bridges are structurally deficient, a classification that means those bridges are in need of attention. But current attention is on the Oroville Dam in California, that we reported on earlier this week. Crews have been working to shore up the emergency spillway in an effort to fortify the structure. And as Aditi Roy reports, even though the mandatory evacuation has been lifted, the concerns have not gone away. It's a race against time in Oroville, California, as choppers buzz in the air, carrying bags filled with gravel to shore up the eroding emergency spillway of the Oroville Dam, trying to beat the next round of storms, while homeowners brace for them, ready to evacuate a second time if the threat becomes real. They said to be ready to just put the stuff back in, so if you want to get fresh clothes and if something does happen to throw it back in your vehicle and get back on the road. The spillway's crumbling condition after several back-to-back -back winter storms prompted fears of a 30-foot wall of water gushing downstream and sparked the evacuation of 200,000 residents living downstream. Now officials say they've lowered the water level to ease the threat and have downgraded the evacuation order to an evacuation warning. The situation even got the White House's attention. The situation is a textbook example of why we need to pursue a major infrastructure package in Congress. Dams, bridges, roads, and all ports around the country have fallen into disrepair. 
The American Society of Civil Engineers, which comes out with an infrastructure report card every four years, gave America's dams a D in its most recent report in 2013. The report says by 2020, 70% of the total dams in the U.S. will be 50 plus years old. The Association of State Dam Safety says the number of high hazard dams, or ones whose failure could cause loss of lives, is increasing dramatically. The organization also says it will cost $21 billion to repair the country's aging dams. Experts say dam owners are responsible for those repairs. And since most of the country's dams are privately owned, analysts say funding repairs is a challenge. A lot of privately owned dams um, don't have that type of revenue stream and it can be difficult for a dam owner to, to uh, find the financing necessary to, to make upgrades to their dam. As policymakers debate the state of the nation's infrastructure, residents in Oroville watch and wait. I mean, I could see it from here, and if I seen the break, well then, adios, I'm out of here. As residents monitor those lake levels closely, the Trump administration has approved federal funds to help pay for some of those repair costs here at the Oroville Dam. For Nightly Business Report, Aditi Roy, Oroville, California. Rebuilding America will not be cheap. The president has talked about investing as much as $1 trillion. Well, today on Capitol Hill, a number of transportation executives told lawmakers which types of projects they think are needed most. Morgan Brennan has more. Executives of the BNSF and Amtrak Railroads, Trucker Schneider, and industrial shipper Dow Chemical all testified. As senators lamented the starry state of roads, bridges, tracks, and ports signaling just how willing this new Congress potentially is to finally find a way to update America. Remember, we got an inheritance from our grandparents, the best infrastructure on the globe. We've now trashed that inheritance. It's time for our generation to step up and do the right thing, make the investments so that our children and grandchildren can again be the number one on the planet Earth, not just for the quality of our infrastructure, but that infrastructure ensures that we will continue to be the dominant economy. Ahead of the hearing, Amtrak chief Wick Mormon said it will take $28 billion over 20 years to make the investments needed to modernize, much of it along the passenger railroad's most profitable route, the Northeast Corridor. We have 100-year-old major infrastructure up there. and It suffers from reliability issues today. They're only going to get worse, and something has to be done. And in fact, you've seen uh, recently the states of New York and New Jersey come together and we're going to start replacing a bridge up there as the first step in the long process that's well over 100 years old. So I, I, think, th I think the impetus is there. At the top of Amtrak's list, the $12 billion gateway program, which includes new rail tunnels between New York City and New Jersey. On the freight side, Matt Rose, executive chairman of Berkshire Hathaway owned BNSF, focused on regulatory and tax reform as well as ways infrastructure improvements could be carried out to ensure freight railroads, which fund their own networks, remain competitive against truckers using public roadways. Congress must find a new way to at least increase the commercial user's contribution to the infrastructure that they use through increased fuel taxes, a weight distance fee, or similar proxy. This isn't something that must happen eventually. It's time to look at it now. The trucking industry, to its credit, also recognizes this. Christopher Lofgren, CEO of privately held Schneider, focused on new technology, from federally mandated electronic logging devices to truck automation to even cybersecurity, as a connected network becomes the trucking business model of the future. The hearing was the latest fact-finding mission, as lawmakers try to determine what it will take to modernize America's infrastructure, and do so without breaking the bank. For a nightly business report, I'm Morgan Brennan. Verizon reportedly gets a better price for Yahoo, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. Multiple reports say the wireless carrier is nearing a new agreement with Yahoo to acquire the tech company's core assets for up to $300 million less than its initial offer. Last July, Verizon planned to buy the company for nearly $5 billion, but doubt was cast on the closing of the merger following Yahoo's disclosure that it suffered two big hackings. Verizon shares were off a fraction at 48.08. Yahoo rose nearly 1.5% to 45.65. Pepsi said strong sales for the company's healthier snack options helped lift revenue above expectations. The maker of Gatorade and Sabra Hummus, who knew, also reported better than expected profit, but gave full year guidance that was shy of estimates. 
Shares down 19 cents at 106.73. Meantime, Soda Stream saw its profit more than triple and top estimates in its latest quarter. The maker of home beverage carbonation systems said strong demand for sparkling water products helped results. The company also posted higher revenue. Shares rose a better than 4%, 4.5%, I should say, to 49.54. Late yesterday, asset manager Fortress Investment Group said it would be bought by Japanese technology company SoftBank for more than $3 billion. That merger is set to transform SoftBank into one of the world's largest asset managers. Fortress gained nearly 29% to $7.99. Despite a rise in enrollment, Molina Healthcare posted an unexpected loss and revenue that was worse than expected. The health insurer cited challenges in the Affordable Care Act marketplace. The company also gave weak earnings guidance for the year. Shares initially fell more than 10 percent after hours, but ended the regular session up just a fraction to 59.89. And Time Warner shareholders voted in favor of its planned merger with AT&T. The companies are now one step closer to finalizing their more than $85 billion deal, which still needs approval from U.S. officials. Shares of AT&T were up about a percent to 41.12. Time Warner was off seven cents to 96.32. Demand for Cisco's security products helped offset sluggish results in its traditional switcher business. The Dow component earned 57 cents a share. That was a penny better than estimates. Revenue, though, fell nearly 3 percent. Fifth straight quarterly decline to roughly $11.5 billion. Shares, volatile after hours, initially falling, then popping. Josh Lipton has more on Cisco's quarter. $3.3 billion. That was one big number in Cisco's results. First, the company's core switching business, and that was down some 5% year over year. But RBC's Mitch Steves says that was a bit better than his forecast. He says Cisco's performance and guidance demonstrates that the company is moving away from its traditional markets and to the right parts of the business. Cisco, of course, became a tech titan with its switching and routing businesses. But as companies now move to the cloud, they buy less hardware. Of course, Cisco understands those trends, which is why Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins is focused on owning, developing, and distributing more software. To that end, Cisco recently agreed to buy software developer App Dynamics for $3.7 billion. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, San Francisco. Coming up, can new technologies keep us safe when we get behind the wheel? Here is a jolting statistic. The number of people who died in a car accident in the U.S. has hit its highest level since 2007. Blame it on a number of factors, including higher speed limits, drunk driving, as well as texting and driving. Phil LeBeau takes a look at the numbers and whether some new technologies may keep us safer behind the wheel. Driving in America has become deadlier. The National Safety Council estimates more than 40,000 people died in car accidents last year, the most since 2007. It caps the steepest two-year rise in auto fatalities since 1964. Some of it is because drivers are going faster as states raise speed limits, while distracted driving remains a huge problem. Ironically, highway deaths are rising even as new technologies like lane departure warning systems are becoming more common. But the National Safety Council says some of these new systems are being ignored by drivers. There are haptic warnings, oral warnings, visual warnings. Some of these warnings are confusing to drivers and some of them are the functionality is really not there and so drivers are turning them off. Doug Simpson, the founder and CEO of Navdi, thinks he has a way to keep drivers from picking up their phone. Since late last year, Navdi has sold a device that projects text messages, emails, and navigation onto a small screen in front of the driver. Navdi believes drivers will not stop texting or calling, so a head-up display is a safer approach to handling the issue. 
people are going to make phone calls. You know, they are going to use turn-by-turn uh, -turn navigation. They are going to, going to listen to music. Uh, this is a, a far safer way uh, to do those things in the car uh, than the alternatives. Deborah Herzman disagrees. Doing these things don't make drivers safer. They make them more distracted and split attention between the roadway and these other tasks. In fact, many drivers remain their own worst enemies when they're behind the wheel. That's why automakers and tech firms are investing more than ever into devices and systems designed to keep us from crashing into other cars or people. But as the latest numbers show, we are a long ways from seeing a big reduction in highway fatalities. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. And to read more about new technologies and distracted driving, head to our website, nbr.com. Before we go, though, here's another look at the record day on Wall Street. The Dow added 107 points, the Nasdaq gained 36, and the S&P 500 advanced 11 points. We'll see what happens tomorrow, right? Yes, we will. That does it for us tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for me as well. I'm Tyler Matz. Good night. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.